Great. So in this session, in this women's track, um, I thought that it would be really good to look at a whole book. We're going to look at the book of Titus. Uh, We've got quite a bit of time together because we have an hour and a half in these sessions. I don't want to absolutely wear you out. Uh, So what we're going to do is we're going to cover little bits of Titus in the talk that I do and then other sections of it in small groups. Uh, So the handout you've got on on your chair will be fairly useless to you in my talk I'll just warn you now but very very essential in your small group Uh, but it does give you the bits of the passage that I'm going to be speaking from but seeing as Titus is quite a short book I thought it'd be helpful to read through it together Um, it shouldn't take too long and as we read through it I've put up a couple of questions here for us to be thinking about Uh, So this will help us to kind of understand the letter as a whole so that when we dive into the passages, we'll kind of understand a little bit more about why, I won't give you the answer to the first question, but why the person who wrote it, wrote it, and who they're writing it to. So what we're going to look out for is who it's from, uh, who it's written to, uh, whether there's any indication of why the letter's been written, what the situation is that's being written into And uh, also you might want to look out for any repeated words or themes that are going on in the book. Sorry if you can't read that very clearly. Um, And something that I like to do, and I think this stems from the fact that, like I just shared, when I became a Christian, I wasn't really very well taught and I didn't know how to read the Bible. And in fact, the only Bible I had was this little Gideon's New Testament that I'd been given at school. And I would just go to that bit of the front that says where to find help when. And I would really just... I really wanted to learn, but nobody taught me how to learn. And then when I went to um, St. Ebbs in Oxford, they taught us how to read the Bible. And it was just, in a way, it was so simple, looking out for repeated words, just thinking about why it was written and who had written it. And for me, it was so exciting because I'd I'd really wanted to know about God, but I just didn't have the tools. And so I'm sorry if you're probably really familiar with this and not very excited about it. But for me... These sort of questions were really instrumental for me, beginning to understand the Bible for myself. So I thought that we'd use those questions as we were reading through it. Something I like to do um, if I'm teaching, which um, I am today, is um, I would photocopy the passage. And actually, with some of these things, like repeated words and themes, I'd circle them. I'm the sort of person who likes to scribble, but I don't like to mess up my Bible. So having a photocopy is helpful. So I've done 10 copies. If you're that sort of person, and it would help you stay awake by being able to scribble on a copy of it, or if you've forgotten your Bible, then I'll just hand these around. Grab one if you want one. There's not enough for everybody. So if you prefer to just read it in your Bible, then uh, don't take one. Um, I didn't want to kind of tie you all with the same brush and treat you all like teenage girls. <laughs> um, and also, I'm going to be reading from the NIV, but I'll just warn you now that in the book of Titus, if you've got a different translation, some of the words are translated quite differently because um, they, some of the words only appear once in the New Testament. So I think when it comes to Bible translation, it's been quite difficult to work out exactly what the writer meant. So don't panic if what you're reading, say, in the ESV, seems a little bit different to what we're reading in the NIV. The stuff that we are learning is very much the same across the translation, so don't let that worry you. Um, But you might really notice that standing out quite starkly to you, I think perhaps especially in chapter one. Um, Does anybody want to do some of the reading? Probably helpful if you read from the NIV, just so that we're all going for the same thing. That's what's on the photocopy as well. Oh, don't all shout at once. Great, Lena. Oh, can you borrow some of these? Great, thanks. Do you want to read chapter one? Anybody else for chapter two? Thank you very much, Anne. And I'll read chapter three. Okay, great, thanks. Do you want to start us off, Lena? Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, 
not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, <clears throat> holy and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of the Cretes' own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the mere, merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but their actions, by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. We must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, Teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. <coughs> Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great golden Saviour, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and always to be gentle towards everyone. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to <coughs> devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. 
As soon as I send Artemis Leticicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Okay, um, let me suggest that maybe we turn in twos and threes and just see if you can answer any of these questions. It doesn't matter if you can't get much down, but it'll just help us to begin thinking. Uh, When you look at why it's written, there's something right up front that will help you think about that. Um, And yeah, don't worry too much about the repeated words and things, but you may have noticed something. So do you want to turn in twos and threes just for one or two minutes and see what you think? Brilliant. I, you may not have got f- past the first couple, but it's actually great to see you digging into this because I don't want you to just listen. I actually want you to look at this for yourselves and get excited about what what the Bible says. So has anybody got any ideas for, well, this is not so difficult. Who is it from? Who is it to? Brilliant. Okay, Paul to Titus. And um, what, uh, what, any ideas about why Paul's writing to him? What's Paul's aim in writing? Any ideas? To show people how they should behave. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. So where did you see that? Um, well, in things like the older women teaching. Yeah. Women. Brilliant. I mean, I think you actually see it right up front in 1 verse 1. Paul says that he is a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And for me, this has been a bit like a key that's unlocked the whole book. It's quite different in some different translations. But essentially he's saying that your faith and your knowledge of the truth go hand in hand with your godliness. You can't have good works without understanding the truth, and you cannot understand the truth without having good godliness. Um, And I think, you know, as we were looking at what Martin Luther was, uh, one of the things that he was very convinced of was that good works, actually, good works in and of themselves are not a good thing, but knowledge of the truth leading to godliness, that is what the gospel is all about. And we see that worked out throughout the whole book, Uh, especially in chapters two and three, we begin to see how the truth works itself out in lots of different areas for different groups of people. Um, did anybody pick up what the situation is um, where Titus is? Chapter 1, verse 10, possibly. Yep. It has something of that people are needing to be silenced because they're teaching things that are... Really helpful, yes. So there's a big culture of false teaching, many rebellious people full of meaningless talk, deception, the circumcision group who are disrupting whole households. They must be silenced. You get it again. In 3 verse 9, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, arguments, quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. You get the sense that as a minister, Titus is up against quite a lot of people who want to waste his time. And and worse than that, actually, are teaching things that ought not to be taught, and so disrupting whole households. What else did we find out about the situation on this island of Crete? Verse 16 of chapter 1 mm-hmm. talks about a gap between the claims of some of the people yes. and their actions. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. The society in general is very corrupt. From the chapter 1 verse 12. Yeah, could you read out chapter 1 verse 12? Um, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy Britons. Yeah, I mean, that is some indictment, isn't it? Always. It's not just they're liars, they're brutes, and they're a bit lazy. They're always liars evil brutes, lazy gluttons. That is pretty, a pretty bad situation to find themselves in. And we think, you know, oh, our society's gone so badly downhill. Maybe not so much. Um, any other things about the situation? I think that, you know, Titus is trying to start a church there. What's going on in 1 verse 5? He'd been left there by Paul. Paul yes. In, in Brilliant. Yeah. And so um, in the NIV it says, I've left you in Crete so that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And then he tells him all these qualifications that an elder must be 
uh, and an overseer, and he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. And I love the fact that Paul just writes, appoint elders, and then he tells them what it's to be like. And I'm like, behind those two words must have been this massive headache <laughs> for Titus of finding godly guys who he could trust who are um, able to encourage and refute. You think, oh, I wonder how many months, how many weeks, how many years, how many tears were spent doing that. And, and actually, in some respects, you think, amazing that the church has muddled on ever since and that we have made it to the point we're in now. And yet how many of us probably feel that we're in churches that this is still a fairly accurate description of? Things aren't quite in order, they're not quite finished. I mean, maybe I speak as I find being in a church plant, but I think even in well-established churches, often there's a sense that it would be lovely to have a really thoroughly amazing eldership who are all really good at encouraging, refuting and actually, often, the church can feel in something of disarray. Um, and so, think, think with me for a minute. If this is the situation that Titus is in, you know, the church is unfinished. The Cretan culture is always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. There's this abundance of false teaching around. And people who claim to know God, but by their actions, they're just living a completely different life. Uh, how do you think you might feel? Check out some words. Overwhelmed. Yep, absolutely overwhelmed. Inadequate. Yep, totally. Wanting to run. Wanting to run. I'd be like, Paul, is there space in your suitcase? I'm coming back with you, mate. Yeah, totally. So I've got a few words that I thought of. I'm going to write them up. I think um, very much in line with what you said. So I think um, if you start with the um, church being in disarray, um, I think that it would be quite easy to be discouraged. And to think, you know, particularly when you look at the qualifications for elders and overseers, you think, where is he going to find guys like this? You know, it must be easy to lose heart. And it's just interesting um, when you read, I haven't done loads of reading about Martin Luther, but I was reading some stuff about Catherine von Bora, his wife, And she, um, I read, during one very difficult period, Luther was carrying many burdens and fighting many battles, usually jolly and smiling. He was instead depressed and worried. And I think how accurately that can portray the situation that we as ministry wives can see our husbands in. Uh, How often, you know, I, I find John T, instead of being jolly and smiling, depressed and worried, And I think some people, uh, we found this in Enfield especially when we set up our um, church plant there, was that John T was, it was just him. And we had some really great elders, but it can be really hard if you're in a small church and there's just just the pastor and, and you, his wife. It can be very easy to be discouraged and to think, where do we even start Uh, that can be really tough and really quite isolated. And I think it's encouraging to think, actually, this isn't a situation that the Bible is silent on. This is the reality, that it can be very discouraging being in church ministry. And so I was thinking about the culture in Crete. And if I'm honest, if I was Titus, I would feel utter despair. Always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. How on earth? Are we going to change them and make them into godly people? What? How is that even going to happen? Uh, I think with the false teaching, you get a really strong sense in chapter 3 um, when he says, chapter 3, verse 8, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things. Um, <clears throat> these things are excellent and profitable for everyone, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, etc., because these are unprofitable and useless. So I feel that Titus has this choice. He can stress the trustworthy message, which is excellent and profitable, or he could get embroiled in foolish controversies and arguments, which are unprofitable and useless. And you get a strong sense that Paul is saying, Titus, you're going to be easily distracted. You're going to be pulled away from the trustworthy message and get distracted. It's not going to be easy to keep on stressing the trustworthy message when all this false teaching is going to distract you. So I think distractions... I mean, distractions, not just false teaching, but distractions are a massive struggle, I think, in my husband's ministry. And I know, even as I was writing this talk, I wrote the word distracted, and then I thought, 
I haven't got Jonty's Christmas present. And I went, clicked from my Word document onto Amazon. And I was there for 10 minutes. And I went, oh, I'm writing a point about distractions. And I have just been massively distracted. And how easy it is to be drawn away from stressing the trustworthy message, teaching the trustworthy message, loving the trustworthy message, to spend your time on things that are unprofitable and useless. And that is the reality, I think, And the fourth thing, I think everywhere implied but nowhere clearly stated, is in 1 verse 1, if Paul is writing to further the faith of God's elect or for the sake of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, he is writing to God's elect and he's teaching them the gospel. He says God's elect need their faith to be strengthened, to be furthered. God's elect need knowledge of the truth. And I particularly love that in the session we've just had, that Martin Luther firmly believed that Christians need the gospel. And so I think that if Christians need their faith to grow, then it is obvious that actually doubt is another really big issue. If we need knowledge of the truth, if we need to have our faith furthered, then doubt is a reality that we live with. And I think this was brought home to me because I was teaching this. I, I read Titus a lot with the young girls in our church. And um, I was studying this very passage recently with a young girl who'd grown up in a Christian home. She'd come to us not long ago um, in September. And she, to me, I, would, I was raving about her to people. Oh, she's such a model churchgoer. She brings people to the evangelistic events. She comes to the prayer meeting. She wants to re- meet and read one-to-one. And I was actually meeting with her because I was hoping that she'd become a small group leader in the new year. And she said to me, as we read these words, she said, I know it so well and I know how to look the part, but I think I'm just going through the motions. I go from one day to the next, hardly giving God a second thought. And I thought, that's, isn't that interesting that she, I was raving about how she was the model Christian, and in some respects, actually, I think it was just a crisis of confidence in a young girl. But to say those words, I think I'm just going through the motions, made me think doubt, re- the devil wants us to doubt, and how easy it is for us, not just for her as a young 19 year old rocked up in London, but for us who've maybe been Christians for, for ages to go through the motions. We know very well how to do this and how to look the part and how to week in, week out, do the good stuff that we see in chapter 2 of Titus. But the reality is that we need to know, and what I was saying to her was, we need to know the truth. That's what Paul says in Titus 1 verse 1. What we need is to be convinced of the truth. That's what faith is. Faith is being convinced. And we need our faith to be further. We need to be increasingly convinced of the truth. That is what we need to hear if we're going to genuinely uh, live godly lives. And I, it reminded me, when I was at um, St Ebbs, of the guy who was the student worker there. He used to... I, I don't know how this happens, but he was friends with John Chapman, who's this famous evangelist. I was a bit bowled over by the fact he was friends with John Chapman. But he said that John Chapman regularly woke up and had massive doubts about what he believed. John Chapman was this amazing evangelist, converted... Really, lots and lots of Christians wrote amazing evangelistic material. And I was just so... I I know this sounds sad, but I was really encouraged. I thought, wow, even he wakes up and has doubts every morning. But what this guy did, he said, uh, John Chapman used to get up and he used to look in the mirror and he'd say to himself, Chapo, did Jesus really live? Yes. Did Jesus really die? Yes. Did Jesus really rise again? Yes. Well, what are you messing around at? Get on with it. And I just thought that, in essence, is so simple and yet so profound. It's exactly what Paul is saying. He says that we need knowledge of the truth. And that's true for each of these things, that when we're doubting we need knowledge of the truth, when we're distracted, Paul says we need to cling to the truth. We see that in um, chapter 1, verse 9. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. When we're in despair, one of the main themes in this book Did anybody notice when the words repeated over and over and over? In chapter 2, certainly. Self-control. Yes, self-control was definitely repeated over. Teach, 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 teach. If you're despairing about the situation that you're in, 
they need the truth. They need to be taught the truth. Teach, teach, teach. And when we're discouraged, that's when we need the truth. We need the truth in the church. We need to have friends who believe the truth. Titus needed elders who believed the truth. That was how he would avoid being discouraged, was to raise up elders. So my husband, on his own, leading a church plant, when he was discouraged, he needs others who believe the truth. That's what he needs. And so the truth is absolutely fundamental. And I think that's why... So Paul, you know, he must be very aware of what he's leaving Titus to do. And I think he calls him my true son. I imagine there was something of a wrench in Paul as he left Titus in what was not a great situation with an unfinished church needing elders... Such a terrible society. Paul, knowing the reality that God's elect need their faith to be furthered, and maybe thinking, if I leave Titus, is he going to shrivel and die, or is he going to grow? Actually, Paul says to him, he writes to him, and the very first thing he writes to him is, I'm doing this to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Titus, this is the key. Knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. All you need is knowledge of the truth, and that is what will do the work. The truth, the truth, the truth. So I want to spend the rest of our um, the talk just skipping straight through to chapter 3, verses um, 3 to 8, really. And I just want us to think, what is the truth? Because Paul, in this letter, he tells Titus that he needs the truth, but it's not until chapter 2, verse 11, and then again in chapter 3, verse 8, that he really spells it out what the truth is both times that he speaks about the truth in those two passages he says that the grace of god appeared he says but when the kindness of and love of god our savior appeared this is the truth the truth is just as john chapman said did jesus really live and the answer is yes he appeared if we could have been in the right place at the right time, we would have seen him with our own eyes. So my son has got textbooks at home um, on the Romans, given to him by school, completely not Christian books at all. And in there, it has stuff about Jesus, because Jesus really lived. And I was just really excited to find in my kid's school book, Jesus, a history book, because Jesus really appeared And this is what we need to be convinced of, that he really did appear. And on those days when you wake up and the devil says to you, is it really worth it? Why don't you just live like your next door neighbour who's having such a great time? You think, but Jesus Christ appeared. That is the essence of the truth. So we're going to look in chapter, uh, I think, so today we're going to do this bit in chapter one that we've done a little bit of, and you're going to look a bit more in chapter one when we split into groups. But I want to go through to chapter three, and we're just going to spend some time looking at how Paul ends the book. So when he um, speaks about the truth, we see it in verses, chapter three, verses three through to eight. And I know that this is the truth that Paul's talking about, because in verse eight he says, This is a trustworthy saying. And you say, well, what's a trustworthy saying? Verses 3 to 7 are the trustworthy saying. They're the truth. They're the gospel, the good news that Titus is to teach. And so let's look at verses 3 to 7 and see what the truth really is. So in 3 verse 3, the truth starts with, at one time, we too were. I think just... Pause there for a minute, because I think for Titus it must be such an encouragement. As he looks at the situation in Crete, he thinks, at one time, we too were. It's a really level playing field. The only reason Titus is where he is is because he's understood the truth. And therefore he's got hope for these Cretans that they too can be transformed by this gospel. What were they? Well, they were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved Uh, So let's think about each of these in turn. Now, uh, imagine um, one of my kids breaks a vase. There's different reasons why they might have broken the vase. They might have broken it because they were foolish. Okay, if they were foolish when they broke the vase, it might have been that they didn't realise that if the vase got knocked over, it was glass, it would smash. They were foolish, they were ignorant, they didn't really understand. It doesn't make it right that they knocked it over, but it does help you understand what happened. How about if they were disobedient? I might have said, don't play football in the house. I turn my back, go out, football is played in the house, the vase gets knocked over and smashed on the floor. Now that's a little bit different, isn't it? Because they've deliberately done that. I told them not to play football in the house because things would smash and lo and behold, things get smashed. 
Now, it might be that they were deceived. Perhaps Big Brother comes up and says, Ah, that vase, it's not really going to break when you knock it over. Why don't you give it a try? <laughs> Little one knocks it over. <gasps> he was deceived. It was a lie. Now, it doesn't make it OK that he did it, but you do understand how it got smashed. And then maybe it was because all their friends were around. They knew that mum said don't play football, but there was immense pressure from their friends to play football and they just go ahead and do it because they feel they've got no choice and the vase gets smashed. In that situation, they were enslaved. They didn't feel they had any choice. They were going along with the crowd. And so can you see how, actually, what Paul describes about um, what we all were, we can understand why Crete is like what it is, always liars, evil glutes, lazy gluttons. It's partly because they're foolish, They're ignorant of the fact that there's a God who's created them to live with him. And they ignore this fact, although in Romans 1, Paul says it's plain to see from creation. Also, they're disobedient. Rather than listening to and walking with their creator, they live as if they're in control. They do what they want. They don't listen to God. But they're also like this because they're deceived. The devil is is at work in this world, and we see that he's at work through false teachings. So perhaps they've been taught things that are wrong. And that helps to explain why they're persisting in this behaviour, even though it's clearly wrong. Uh, Maybe the devil is lying about what God is like, about what he's done. Maybe, as in Martin Luther's day, uh, there was lies around about how you get right with God, that maybe you just pay money, that you don't actually have to um, hear the truth and turn to him. But they're also enslaved. No matter how many New Year's resolutions these Cretans make about their lying their evil behaviour and their laziness, actually they can't change because they're enslaved. They cannot have any power to change themselves. Um, And I think, you know, what is it that they're enslaved by? What I find really interesting here is that we see what it leads to, um, living in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But Paul digs deeper and he says the reason that they're like that is because they're enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Actually, the root of the problem is not the bad things that they're doing. Their problem isn't that they're liars or that they're evil brutes or that they're lazy gluttons. Their problem is that they love, they're passionate and enjoy the pleasures of other things rather than God. And that manifests itself then in their evil behaviour. And I think that you know, the thought that actually the root of sin is that they love things more than God, they're enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures, really challenges me. Because, you know, actually I think, well, maybe I don't go out and do really bad stuff. But do I really have my greatest passion for God? Do I really find him to be my source of greatest pleasure Am I passionately praising him, finding pleasure in his kindness and love and his mercy, his goodness, his greatness? Actually, I think the reality is that I'm fairly passionate about my next meal. (laughs) I get great pleasure out of holidays. Those are things I love. That's what will get me through January, rather than it being God. And so, actually, the bad stuff, the anger, the envy, the bad feeling comes because deep down we're pursuing passions and pleasures that aren't God. That was the problem with the Cretans. That is the problem in my heart. And I'm not sure that by the time Titus has read verse 3, that he's feeling at all encouraged. I actually wonder if he's feeling quite a lot worse. He's thinking, okay, I thought things were bad, but now I look and I find it's not just bad on the surface, but it's really bad deep down. And I wonder if actually Titus looks inside his own heart and thinks, wow, these things are still alive and well even in me. I thought it was just doubts I had to deal with. But I see that I'm still foolish. I ignore God. I'm still disobedient. I don't obey him. I'm often listening to lies. I'm deceived by the devil who says you're a rubbish Christian, who wakes me up every morning saying, did Jesus really rise from the dead? And I know that I'm still enslaved. I still love food and chocolate and All of this stuff, I love it probably more than I love God. And so I think that in the face of this, actually, discouragement, despair, distraction and doubt, that's actually, you know, it's almost worse rather than better. This is really hard stuff. And it's interesting because I was thinking about this in the last talk that we've just heard about Martin Luther when he talked about the Amfektungen, the 
um, what do we call it, the sufferings of the soul, the feelings of darkness and despair. And he said that we need these things. This, this really kind of changed my feeling about Titus slightly, that these things are essential for us to understand why we need the gospel. And I wonder if that's true, because actually for Titus, how incredibly bright is the light of the gospel going to shine in the next verse when he realises just how hard it really is and just how big the problem really is. Because the way that Paul's laid out the truth here is you're in utter despair by the end of verse 3. But then look at verse 4. The truth is but, but God our Saviour appeared. He actually appeared. That's what makes the saying trustworthy. That's why it says in 1 verse 2, God who does not lie. In a culture full of liars, actually the truth is that God appeared This isn't something somebody made up. There were hundreds of eyewitnesses. Really no respectable historian will refute the fact that Christ appeared. He appeared. He definitely appeared. That's what's just so amazing. This is why it's the truth. He appeared. And how did he appear? So imagine I come back and I find the vase has been broken. I'd be pretty mad, right? How does God appear? God appears, he finds we've been foolish, we're not just foolish, we've been disobedient as well, and we've been deceived, and we've been enslaved. How would we expect him to appear? Surely we would expect him to appear in wrath and anger. And yet look at verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared. The truth is extraordinary. He appears completely the opposite of how we would expect, in kindness and in love. So this truth isn't just true, it's beautiful truth, it's amazing truth. He appeared in kindness and love. He didn't appear just to show us how foolish, disobedient, enslaved we were. He appeared, have a look. When the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared. So it's not God appeared and came to tell us off and tell us how very wrong we were. He came as our Saviour. And I think this is one of the things that I've really seen as a theme running through this letter, is that the truth saves. Jesus appeared not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So in 1 verse 13, when Paul says that Titus is to rebuke people sharply, he does it so that they will be sound in the faith. His aim in rebuking them sharply is not to crush them and to tell them how very wrong they are, but so that they will be sound in the faith, so they'll be restored, so that they will be saved. You see this again in um, chapter 3, verse uh, verse 10. Warn a divisive person once and tell them to get lost. No, that's not what it says. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. And isn't that such a reflection of how God has dealt with us? For sure, he will appear in judgment. He is coming again. Paul is quite clear about that in chapter 2, verse 13, that he is coming. there is going to be another appearing. But when he created the world, he created it, and he created it in such a way that he made Adam and Eve, and he didn't crush them straight away when they ate from the tree. He let them live. And then he appears a second time. He appears with kindness and love in the gospel to show us, to bring us back to himself, to save us. And it's only on the, in a way, the third dealing with humanity when he comes again that he is going to come in judgment. And so Paul says we are to be like that. We are to be patient. This is what our God is like. He doesn't crush us, but he appears to save. And that's what Titus is to be like. When he rebukes people, he's to rebuke them in order that they will be sound in the faith, that they will be saved. So this is the wonderful truth. So, you know, imagine you're like John Chapman. You wake up, you're doubting. You get up, you look in the mirror. The reality is, the but is, in spite of all the darkness I see inside, the doubts, the despair, actually the truth is that Jesus appeared. He appeared in kindness and love, and he appeared to save us. And that is the truth. That's what we need. And he saved us, not because of righteous things that we had done. There's no anything that any good works that we can do that are going to make this situation better but simply because of his mercy 
through the washing of rebirth and renewal. So these are the washing of rebirth and renewal. Um, we're born into this foolish, disobedient, and deceived and enslaved family, Adam's family. And rebirth is washing us in such a way that we're born again into the, the spirit's family, into the God family. And that means that actually no longer are we foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved. Actually, we're now free. We're set free and we can live godly lives. This is how the truth changes us, that we've been reborn. We are fundamentally changed. We can now live in a way that is godly. But I love the fact that it's not just rebirth, that we are renewed. And I think that, again, in the talk earlier that we had, we saw that Luther, he said, simultaneously, we are righteous and yet, what was the word? Simultaneously righteous and yet still the chief of sinners. Our experience is that still, we, although we're free not to, we still can be foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved. And the reality is that even in those situations, there is the washing of renewal by the Holy Spirit. We're renewed, we're washed, we're made clean again. And we can be made clean how many times? Have a look at 3 verse 6. It's not just three times. He pours out this Holy Spirit on us generously. The washing of renewal is there for us every single day. So this is the amazing truth. We've been washed. We are justified, he says in verse 7 justified and there's even more sorry I feel like I'm going on for ages but this truth is just so amazing he's not just justified us and made us righteous we have become heirs having the hope of eternal life heirs is such a wonderful thing I had this friend at the school gate and um, she invited my uh, child my youngest round to her house for a play date which is quite unusual in London and she wasn't going to be back for a few more minutes so she gave me her key and I let myself in and it was um, a flat just behind Borough Tube Station so really central really amazing location and I let myself in with my boys and it was a complete mess it was like a builder's yard there was coke cans everywhere builder's mess I managed to clear off three seats move the coke cans and some of the mess there was boxes everywhere and we sat sort of perched on the edge of these dirty seats in this studio flat, waiting for her to come back. Anyway, she comes in, she says, oh, are you going to leave him? Come back in a, in a while, you know, come back in a couple of hours. I'm like, hey, um, how do we play this one? And so I said, oh, I'll come back in an hour. 55 minutes later, I'm there at the door, desperate to get in. Anyway, she ushers me in, and there's no sign of any of the kids in this flat. She goes, why don't you come upstairs? Well, I went up these stairs, and at the top of the stairs, there's this just beautiful, stunning wood, reclaimed wood floors, um, massive rooms, uh, office thing, library thing. And she says, oh, come on up. We go from the first floor, we go to the second floor. Another amazing suite of rooms and bathroom. Third floor, fourth floor, there's this beautiful kitchen, absolutely staggering. And then she says, come and see upstairs. Penthouse, like open garden on the roof with the shard just there. And the London Eye and Big Ben just there. And I was like, wow. I thought she lived in the downstairs studio was being converted so they could um, rent it out to somebody. And I thought that is a very good description of how I live as a Christian. I live in this downstairs studio, dirty flat, um, imagining that this is my Christian life. But I'm an heiress. I have one, two, you know, so much to look forward to, so much secure in heaven. I'm there already in a sense. I own it. And I thought, how does she live? She has all of that capital. It must be worth Five, ten million pounds, maybe. How free must she feel to take risks with the way she spends her money? You know, let's go to the theatre. It doesn't really matter if we run out of money because we can rent the downstairs. In fact, we could rent any of our floors, most of them, sell off the penthouse. Um, you know, transform the way I lived. I was just imagining being her, and I was like, you need to be converted because you're seriously the answer to all our church's pr problems with accommodation. <laughs> So I said to my husband, you know, I've got a new best friend. Anyway, um, <laughs> but I thought, I'm just like that as a Christian. If I really understood that I was this heir of eternal life, that my heavenly father owned all of this, that he's so rich, how many risks would I take? Would I be discouraged, in despair, distracted and in doubt? No, I would not. I would just, oh, how exciting. And yet Paul says, <coughs> this is it. We are heirs having the hope of eternal life. He says it in t chapter 2, we're waiting for the blessed hope, 
the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour. You can tell he's so excited. He's not living in the studio flat. He says, I'm just waiting, me, I'm just waiting for this amazing inheritance that's to come. You see it in chapter 1, verse 2, in the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. He has totally got his eyes fixed on the penthouse. He's so excited about it. This is the truth. And this is why I say that the truth is all that Titus needs to know. Paul, he just says it in 1 verse 1. All you need, Titus, is the truth. You need to be convinced of it yourself, chapter 1. You need to have your faith furthered. You need to be utterly convinced that it's true. In 1 verse 9, you need to hold firmly to it. You need to cling to it. In chapter 2, you teach, 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 teach it. And also you entrust it to other people. You raise up elders who will teach it. Um, so that you don't have to be discouraged in your church situation and be on your own. You need other people who believe it. So the truth is all that Titus needs. And I just want to spend a bit of time on the truth, because I thought, you know, hearing all about how much Martin Luther loved the gospel, how good is it for us just to enjoy the gospel? And so the gospel here is that Christ appeared, he appeared in kindness and love, he appeared not just to tell us off, but to save us. And he appeared to give us to, to wash us and give us this amazing inheritance. And that's what John Chapman meant when he said, I get up every morning, I say, did he really live? Did he really die? Did he really rise again? Yes, he did. So let's get on with it. The truth is what we need. Now, this is a bit of a silly thing, but I'm into silly things. I've got, if you'd like, a mirror to remind you to look in the mirror and tell yourself that the grace of God appeared. Then I will leave them here. You can grab a mirror and put it in your purse just as a way of reminding yourself that the grace of God appeared, you don't all have to take one, just like you didn't all have to take the sheets of paper. But I think I like little things that remind me, so I'll leave them out for you. Uh, So what we're going to do now is we're going to split into groups. Like Sarah said, you've got a little dot on your sheet. You've got some questions, and they're really going to help you to unpack a little bit more about the situation um, in Crete in chapter 1, verses 5 to 16. To be honest, um, go through the questions... But if you end up having a good discussion about the truth, you know, don't feel you have to tick every box and answer every question. These small groups are as much about helping us to really think through what we've been learning as well as, you know, so if you're really tired, just, just, um, you you know, you can even take the questions away. But um, we're going to do that, come back together at five to six, and I will remember to say grace, and then we'll go to dinner. Is that okay? Do we need to be a little bit earlier than that? No, 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 because I think dinner's not just... Fine, okay. But this session finishes at six, so let's not kill ourselves on the first day. Um, So, great. Let me just pray as we split into groups and then we can find places to... There we go, great. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth. Thank you that Jesus Christ appeared, that he appeared in kindness and love, that he appeared to save us, that he appeared to wash us through rebirth and renewal, and he appeared to... Make us heirs of eternal life. Father God, we are sorry because we are so full of doubts, discouragement, despair and distractions. And we so, we just forget the truth and we doubt it and we just settle for going through the motions. Father God, I pray that we'd be excited afresh this new year about the truth and that we really would cling to it, be convinced of it and actually want to teach it to the younger women in our church as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.